Hi, in this video we'll be unboxing the new Pine 64 and seeing if it really is worth your money. So what is the Pine A64? Oh, shopping. Pine A64? Honey, are we having pizza? No, darling. No. Pine 64, for all your bits. Ah, uh, no. I have a set of requirements for an SBC that I'm pretty sure a lot of makers have as well. These are in no particular order. Low price, low power, more memory, compatibility with RPI2 GPIO header, ability to power off and on and reset, out of the box RTC and LiPo, more serial ports, USB 3.0, one gigabit ethernet, true 64 bit CPU, at least four cores, under and overclocking capabilities, ability to run Debian and or Windows, Linux support for more recent kernels, and a better IO architecture. Let's see if the Pine stacks up against my requirements. The Pine 64 was launched on Kickstarter more than a year ago, and it didn't take long. It attracted 36,000 backers and reached $1.7 million. I managed to back it and it was only delivered a couple of weeks ago for me. There's a lot of argy-bargy from backers for this particular Kickstarter, but frankly, what Kickstarter project is ever on time? <laughs> so, unfortunately it's been sitting here for two weeks. So let's crack it open and see what it looks like. And yes, this is what a box looks like. It's a wonderful box. Can we just open up already? Come on, I obviously haven't used this tool before. Okay, look, uh, while I'm showing off boxes and anti-static bags, here's a few stats on this new board. The Pine A64 comes in three sizes, with difference between them being memory size, either 512 meg, one gig, and two gig. There was a four gig model that was available to backers, but I haven't yet seen it on their website. This particular model is a two gig version. Uh, seems I've never used sticky tape before as well. Ooh, sticky. The one gig and two gig models are called Pine A64 Plus, and come with camera, MIPI, and touch panel ports and one gig ethernet. The 512 meg model misses out on camera, MIPI and touch panel and only has one megabit ethernet. Ta-da! There we go. Now one thing I did notice on the back side of the board is a lack of cleaning. Usually boards will be cleaned of solder flux, but in my case it was still hanging around. You really want to remove flux as it can etch into metals. I think I'll give this one a run through some flux remover later. Okay, now that we've had a really, really good look at the back side of the board, let's flip it over. And yes, here we are at the good stuff. Uh, okay, it's upside down you fool. Okay, let's freeze frame it so I can run through where everything is. Okay, starting from the top right, working clockwise. We have a 5 volt micro USB power jack, 1 gigabit ethernet or 100 megabit, 4K HDMI touch panel connector, camera port connector, Raspberry Pi 2 compatible GPIO header, standard 3 pin LiPo battery connector, 2 pin RTC battery connector, 2 USB 2.0 ports, solar points for reset and power on and off, optional header for a BLE 4.0 and Wi-Fi module, IR receiver connector, headphone and mic jack, micro SD slot, the EXP bus, EULA E bus and DSi connector. Man, this little baby has everything. And if you're one of the backers from the Kickstarter campaign, don't forget the reset switch in the bag. The Raspberry Pi header is supposed to be electrically compatible with any type of hat you want to attach to it, but can it physically accommodate a Raspberry Pi hat? It seems to fit quite snugly. I also tried the 2.8 inch TFT add-on board from IT, and that seems to fit quite well as well. Let's go back to my original requirements list and see how this board actually performs. First, low price. Hey, it's only $29. Okay, next, low power. Hmm, requires a 2 amp 5 volt power pack. It'd be nice to be lower, but I can live with a max of 10 watt power consumption. Memory, 2 gig, check. Compatibility with RPI2 GPIO headers. Seems to be there. And not only that, whilst being electrically compatible, it can also provide more current to each pin. Power off and on and reset the board. Yep. Out of the box RTC and LiPo. Yep. So what about more UARTs? So on the Pi 2 connector, we, of course, we have the standard ITC, SPI and UART connectors. However, on the EULA connector, we also have another SPI and UART. And don't forget the EXP connector with yet another UART. That more than ticks the box. So what about USB 3.0? Oh, hey, look at that. No USB 3.0. What? Gigabit Ethernet? Yep. A true 64-bit CPU with at least four cores. Excellent. And the dual-core Mali 400 GPU, which will really keep up with a 4K video. Okay, next. It's still early days yet, but the board can house a nice heatsink if you want to overclock and can go up to 1.34 gigahertz. Not a huge overclock, but the underclock is more important for me. This can go down to 480 megahertz, which is nice for a low power projects. 
So what about software? Ubuntu, Debian, same thing. Someone has already made up a Debian 8.0 image. Nice. Oh look, it also runs Android Remix. And what about Windows? Uh, okay, don't worry. So what about IO architecture? This is one of the biggest gripes I have with a Raspberry Pi. Sure, the Raspberry Pi had to cut costs in every way, which means using cheaper semiconductors. There's one chip that provides USB and Ethernet support, with the Ethernet being piggybacked off a USB bus. So you really can't get decent transfer rates through Ethernet. This is particularly important as video resolutions get bigger. The Pi supports 4K video, which means that it should be able to keep up, but I haven't really done some analysis yet on it. So let's go back to our checklist. Seems we have a winner on the basic requirements, but only two USB 2.0 zero ports is a pain in the neck but the other benefits I think may make up for it. Now let's see how the Pine performs in a real world example. Let's take a sample video, say my promo video. There are several common issues that you can experience with the Pine 64 and I seem to have hit all of them. One, you really do need a power pack that delivers at least two amps. It just won't boot up without it. Two, make sure you have a true SD card. You can use H2 Test SW on Windows or F3 on Mac to test if your card is bad or not. Three, you have to plug your Pine 64 into an HDMI monitor. You can't use an HDMI to DVI or VGA adapter. For some reason, it just doesn't work. I didn't have a monitor with an HDMI port, so I had to run it through my TV. Four, the red LED is actually a power LED. It's red to indicate it's working. Okay. Five, the Pine 64 is supposed to have gigabit network speeds. However, if you are suffering from very low network speeds, and I'm talking around four kilobytes per second, then you have to set your NIC to 100 megabit half duplex mode. Seems the kernel drivers aren't up to scratch yet. So, clearly it was not performing particularly well, and here's the reason why. If we take a look at the XORG log file, we'll see the cause of the issue. As you can see, the only video driver that's available to us is the standard frame buffer driver. This has zero graphics acceleration. So what does this all mean? Essentially, the Pine 64 isn't a mature product, and it hasn't had the luxury of all those years that the Raspberry Pi has seen. The real question is, will it gain enough community support to resolve all these issues? Only time will tell but it doesn't look promising. This product clearly took the designers by surprise and they've been struggling to keep up with the demand. However, I do commend them on trying. I'd give this SBC a MicMake rating of 2.5 out of 5. I've seen more polish on Kickstarter products than this and there just seems to be too many issues with this board. Thanks for watching this video. In the next review, we'll be taking a look at the Sibley, which is a nice little BLE module. Until then, see you next time. Oh wait, don't forget to subscribe to the channel.